Hello, and thank you for supporting our planet work. This is CD number two in the series, Insights from the Other Side. On this CD is a live presentation entitled, Why We Have Already Been Saved. Topics include the end of karma, transcending fear as the world seems to come unglued, why we are becoming new creations, and revelations about our near future. Okay, let's get started. Yes? I know you think that in the, in the guidance system that we are in the process of being born into something more. Mm -hmm. Were you showing what that something more is? Yes, and uh, uh, quite interestingly, it's much simpler and much more natural than a lot of spiritual people, uh, New Agers and philosophers have, have uh, been guessing at, really. Um, what we're about to be born into is, <clears throat> when I say we haven't been born yet, the earth is like this egg, of which it is a whole living system. And uh, this is long before I knew what Gaia was. I saw this on the other side. I saw the earth as a living being, a living being, which ever, each and every one of us is a part of the system, the human beings being the part of the system, almost like the brain cells, the part of the system that knows that it is, you see, and is reflective, has a sense of history and time and that sort of thing. The other parts of the system, we have a very narrow view on, on earth right now, the human beings, of what life forms might be, actually. To imagine an entire planet as a, as, a, as a life form, let alone, I was shown the entire solar system is, is our body, our solar body. And uh, uh, to imagine a solar system, which I'll be talking about tomorrow in the workshop, is, is your larger energy body, and the, the energy of the, of the universe is yours too. But basically, what we're about to be born into is something rather, rather marvelous. It really is. We're just getting to the level of mass of consciousness, mass of beings on the planet, mass of brain cells, as you might say, that we're about to, and we're the first part of this system, the Gaia system, the Earth system, that will transcend survival. Up till now, everything that we've been doing from the one cell amoeba to the present life you're living today is very, very, very centered around survival issues. Pay, you know, in human systems, pay the rent, pay your bills, get a job, eat the animal system that they have their levels of it, all the way down, all the way down the entire system. We have millions and millions of years of this kind of activity, vibration, um, patterning in our every cell of our body is, is survival oriented and pushing towards that. And that's why as we evolve out of the animal system into a higher form of consciousness, we're going to, uh, with technology, as I saw on the other side, technology, Wisdom, population density is very, very important to the picture. Very, very important. We need more humans on the planet than we, than we do now to, to get this optimal density of, of brain cells so you can wake up. Uh, you have uh, an order of magnitude of cells in the brain which form a certain form of consciousness, allow you to perceive the universe in a certain way. Uh, it's a very, very special thing that we have here. But all of us are about to realize as we grow, as we expand now very, very rapidly, and it's really keyed into the population expansion, very, very much, much more so than anything else you may have imagined. Uh, as we rapidly get to the right density, we will suddenly realize, as many of you already do, that every human being on the planet is the same human being. The same human being. And it's actually a marvelous system of all these brain cells that can look at each other and explore the universe in their own way, and collect information, and grow and add to the huge database which the human, human species has been building since day one of our, our inception as a human being on the planet. We've been building and building a huge experience and database that is now about to pay off. We are going to transcend very soon, in cosmic time especially, don't even blink, you'll miss it, it's so close now. For many of you it's as close as probably your next breath, it could be. Most of us certainly for sure are close as your next incarnation. This world in which the humanity has transcended survival mode of existence. And secondly, we're also transcending biological limits. We're doing it every day more and more so. Human beings are very good at that. And what that is, is that we are Gaia. We shouldn't separate ourselves from Gaia. We are part of this planet that is transcending. This is what Gaia does. Um, uh, you can see out in the desert what, what humans have done. They can come to a desert and rearrange it into a garden. And in that, in that garden bed, grow anything they want to grow. 
We're absolutely an amazing being. I love being this part of the system. And from what I've seen, I love being any part of the system. But to be the human part of this system or the human part of Godhead just blows me away to even think about it. If you, if you can understand the blessing that it is just being here now, no matter what configuration you're in uh, as a human being, just being human is absolutely an amazing blessing to you. Um, as I've said before, I thank God every day on top of my food chain. <laughs> That, that alone makes things a lot easier every day. So uh, this is this is the first stage that, that, that's about to happen. But as we transcend survival, we, we, we are also processing fear out of the system. This is what all of us are facing big time today. And we've talked about this before uh, in groups that I've been with. Fear is really being processed heavily today. And in, in many, many ways, there's more therapy going on on the planet than ever before in history. It's a detoxification of the human psyche that's happening. And in cosmic time, incredibly quick, when you can think of millions and billions of years, and things are happening in, in light speed now compared to the rest of the system, compared to how trees will evolve a million years from now. Human beings will outdo that in just 10 years. It's amazing what we're doing. We're, we're like beings, we're living at light speed, and we're transcending. Gaia is transcending. Uh, and this is what we're being born into next. The next level of higher consciousness, as I saw it, is the ability to not repeat the past, all the mistakes of the past, which many have interpreted as the end of karma, which is which is starting to happen on mass now. People are not wanting to be like their parents, not wanting to repeat the past, or dissolving old uh, old constrictions to the system. Because the Gaia system, in all of its systems, from 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 atoms all the way up to human systems, wants to be unlimited. And anything that limits the system gets into a lot of trouble. It gets disintegrated. Anything that limits you will build up and build up until you're disintegrated and let go of it. And how many of us are going through that at this time in history right now in our lives? Tremendous disintegration on all levels. Things are happening so fast we think we're going crazy sometimes. We're also, as, as, as and I've pointed this out to scientists that I work with, with every human being that's born on the planet, the system gets wiser. With every burning cell that adds to this system, no matter what it's doing, don't think what it's doing is important all that much. That it is is the importance. That it is living in the system. We'll, we'll harness this potential and blossom it in the future when we realize how special this human consciousness is. When you really understand it, you're going to want to seek it all out, save it, cherish it, rehabilitate it if needed, and bring it whole into the system again. Prisons in the future are going to be light centers. Light centers. Because there's a chakra problem with people, and that's something we'll be talking about in the workshop. How the how the chakra system is your interface to experience. By that I mean the chakra system is your interface into what we call life, from subtle to dense energy, from spirit to matter. And we'll be talking about this in great detail. Um, our science has been working from outside in, and now you know we've gone from uh, uh, biology to uh, cellular biology to molecular biology, and now into quantum biology. Bio biology is energy, and now we're really going to make some headway. Once we get down to the core of our being, which is an atomic being, and subatomic being, an energy form is what we are. Absolute energy form. The thing is that in the modern world. In the blinking of an eye, the last 200 years or so, mankind has come in from the light, and we're light beings. And so things are turning around now, this great need for the light, this, this light and everything around now, this light beer, lollipops, lights and some shoes. This is how we're moving back into light now. <laughs> so, and, it's, and it's coming in, coming in in the most unusual way. Most of the children, technology children, children, toys are very fifth dimensional. And how many people know here uh, know what I'm talking about when I talk fifth dimensional? That's a term. That's about. First dimensional is big bang activity, basic construction of the universe, two uh, D reality. Second dimensional activity is when the uh, atomic particles started forming. 3D is when our 3D world formed. All of these atoms and, and energies coalesced into a physical form that we recognize today. And everything in our, in our space here is based on a three-particle atom. And that atom is an iron-based atom. And where does that come from? Dead stars. So every, every atom in your body is basically from a star system. Many, many millions and trillions of star systems that are beyond, beyond memory even that have coalesced and re-coalesced. And the, uh, the yogis would call it the yugas. This is, this is another yuga that we're into. We've been in many yugas. In fact, I saw on the other side that there are many big bangs going on at the same time. Many, not just one. 
when we're still just trying to deal with the one, we have an infinite number of them going on at the same time in what you might call infinite Godhead. And so 5.4D is when you start getting into a recognition of patterns and cycles. Plants, animals have a taste of this. Humans especially are very aware of a past, a present, a, a future, uh, cycles, patterns. We, we are the type of consciousness, and it's very mental, by the way, uh, that the far end of fourth dimension, which is what we're in now, and crossing over to fifth, is a very mental realm. And, and that being uh, a human being is, who is made of, of, of the atoms of dead stars can figure out a technology and look at a star and tell you what that star is made of and then figure out that it, it's made me. Isn't that an amazing form of consciousness to be this, this, inter this interface with the whole universe? It's absolutely amazing. 5D, which is what we're moving into very, very rapidly now, is the awareness and maddening to some people that all the rules are correct. That in the end, when everything has been said and done in this universe, everyone was right. I figured that one out. Everybody's right. <laughs> That's a mind blower. More than that, the fifth dimensional awareness means that each and every one of you is getting infinitely more psychic than you've ever been. It's just building up and up and up now to a point in which uh, if, if the energy is building up to a point in which if what you're in is not right for you, you won't be able to stand it anymore. So don't resist it. I say, you know, let go and grow. Let go and know now. It's the time to let go. The ungluing of the system is happening. And it's not going to fall or collapse because it never has. It always reincorporates and comes up something new and, and beautiful. So an ungluing of the system is happening because that's the only way growth can happen locked up, especially in our mental and spiritual systems. Uh, how many religions have, has got, have got God locked up? This is God, and that's it. This book is God, and that's it. God, Kaya, all, the universe is unlimited and unrestricted. And we're just coming into that phase now where we even can begin to think that way. But it's a kind of an awareness where you go into an instant knowing now. You don't have to figure things out anymore. If you're still trying to figure it out, it's going to beat you. Because most of the universe, most of Godhead, is a non-intellectual process. We've needed it to build up technology which is going to assist us in our, in, our, in our transcendence, physically, as well as spiritually. But most of the universe is a non-intellectual process. And so if you try to interpret the entire universe through a mental mode, you're going to fall short. Way short of a full, full understanding of, of the universe and life itself. So in fifth dimensional reality, you're more psychic than you ever have been. You're going to be hearing things and seeing things more than ever before. And I, everywhere I go, people, people talk about this. They think they're going crazy. They think they're seeing things. And the truth is, you are. <laughs> you are. And they're for real. We're going, we're going into the consciousness of a fully multidimensional interface. Because once we've reached fifth dimensional level of consciousness, that is the gate to the multidimensional interface, to the cosmos. And so things are widely, just widely opening right now, and wildly for some people. So I say just hang on, trust your life, don't get too mental anymore, and just get into instant knowing. The higher self-contact now is going to be the real big thing that everybody's going to be getting into. A super consciousness, the higher self, which is the guide through this transition period that we're going into. And fifth dimensional awareness, and when we get there, there's no fear. Can you imagine a world without fear? Can you imagine a human being? And you, many of us may think we've met them, but I saw them in the future, your future ancestors. Without fear, them, they're different creatures. They're that, that new creation that's been talked about. You know, It's a new kind of a being. Can you imagine a world in which nothing's taken away from you? That everyone is very important to the system and it's realized. When we start realizing each and every one of us is the same being, then we really start waking up to the next level of higher consciousness. It's not about transcending our physical bodies. It's not about going into uh, starships and all that. Oh, some of that will be happening. And, you know, great. <laughs> you know, see you around. But that millennium that they've talked about is really a metaphor for this, this new creation time that's coming in. When the human species is, is detoxified into a new vibration, into a vibration where fear doesn't exist. And you, you won't be able to take fear with you in the full fifth dimensional awareness. That's why you're having trouble with it right now. It does not exist there. If it did, if you can imagine what your mind-body does to you now, the relation, what you think, 
your emotions, does to your immune system. Just think if you're infinitely more psychic and powerful, what would happen? It just doesn't exist there. I didn't see it. It doesn't exist there. And that is something well worth hanging on for and living for. It really is. And what's amazing is people of the future look back at us as the giants of history. We are giants of history. We are the ones who transmuted fear into the new creation. And uh, how many of you noticed that your children don't seem to be that interested in working anymore? <laughs> this is one of the signs. Don't be too hard on them. It's going to get more and more that way. I was probably one of the first to say when I came back in 82 that there'll never again in history be as many jobs as there was once before. That's because the Industrial Revolution is over. The hard work of mankind is over. Jobs are going south so they can have their revolution and get up to speed with the rest of us. But we're rapidly moving into a non-industrial society. Non-industrial. Now for us, who have become industrial animals for generation after generation, it's almost unimaginable to think, how could a society work? The answer's in your children. They're the ones forming this new society. So be good to them. They're going to be your parents and grandparents. <laughs> so think about it sometimes. <laughs> yes. So when you say we, could you clarify that? Because what pops up for me is say people in Rwanda right now. Mm. How are they included in this process as you perceive it? When I say we, I mean the entire planet, the entire human species. Um, there are what? There are different levels of that being, of being human. Um, there are worker bees, there are the, uh, they're, they're the ones who bring in the visions, and they're the motivators. And the whole system is complete in the human system. Um, I was thinking today as I was driving past the fields and seeing all the workers in the field, I was thinking, this is what holds us up. You know? People that grow food for us, children who are our future, the trees that breathe and clean the air for us. This is what holds us up. Without that, well, would you be thinking about higher consciousness or any of these luxuries that we have in this human world? When I say we, I mean all of us. And when we realize that, and the military has already started the transmutation into a service organization to rapidly get help to where it's needed. Right now, children starving and people being hurt in Rwanda is like your foot, like your foot rotting off and you doing nothing about it. We're about to wake up to that and address it and realize that's a part of us, our body, our literal body part of ourselves that we need. And again, the future is not going to be so much what you're doing. That's not important. The importance is that you are here. Can you imagine people looking at you and just you being here is the best thing in the world? It doesn't matter what you do anymore after this time. Being here is a good thing. Do what you want. That's why we were given life. To make of it what we will. And we're just beginning to get the trainer wheels on. Way do we get the trainer wheels off? <laughs> and really get a hang of this form of consciousness that we're evolving. Because we're all children right now. Babes, we really are. And all of our human systems reflect that. Our monetary system, our legal system, <laughs> our, our energy distribution systems, our, our economic systems, all of that are the, are the systems of children. Children. But we're about to mature as a species. So the next level of higher consciousness it's just that simple. It's about growing up. It's good. We're going to be as different as adults are to children. As adults are to children. And if you'll notice in all of the living system, the larval, the baby stage is a very short period. Most of your existence is going to be in the adult stage. And that includes in your spirituality and in your future as a species. We have a very, very long adult period ahead of us. Very long indeed. Because we're, tr we're very rapidly transcending biological limits. Very, very quickly now. More, 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 more quickly than many of you may imagine in your own time. In your own time. It's happening all around you. But it's coming in. This is coming in in, in the oddest ways. It's not sort of coming in from the top. It really isn't. You know, Bell Labs and all that. They're sort of getting pieces of it. I'll give you an example of how it's coming in. And, and I know many of you have experienced this. I was in Houston this last weekend doing a talk down there. Staying with some very nice people in a house that was sort of a community house for spiritual people. And I came down uh, one morning and uh, getting a cup of coffee and I, I saw some women sitting around the table and they had their little notebooks out. And these were women that were just normal people, just normal folks, you know, absolutely normal folks. And what, they, what, what I heard started intriguing me. And I walked over and I'm looking and they're comparing notebooks of visions and information that's been coming through them. And it's amazing scientific information. It's transforming information. And I travel a lot, and I see this popping up now more than ever. Common folk are getting it. 
It's not going to be held back by the top at all. They'll get it. But then governments and religions are always the last ones to change. People change first. Then religions change to match it. And governments do too. So it's coming in big time. So I encourage any of you, you get these thoughts, these ideas, write them down, document them, get together with other people. Because what I saw at this table about energy forms and about great information really thrilled me. And then I looked at these people. None of them had any expertise in the field whatsoever at all. So that's just one way, one sign to you that it's coming in big time now, really big time. And the more fear you feel, feel in your life is a resistance factor. We have to learn now to let go. We're going to be safe. The entire human race has made it. We've made it. We've already been saved. And we saved ourselves, and that was the whole thing, the whole plan anyway. The second coming is when you realize that. You take that big breath. You say, we've made it. We have more technology than we can possibly use. We have more food than we know what to do with. And believe me, there's more money out there than anybody knows what to do with in that energy form. We've already made it. Our systems will mature into this reality. And every human being is very special and deserves the utmost quality of life. And we can afford that now. We could not in ancient times without technology and the wisdom of the modern times combined. But now we can. Now we have it. And we're about to realize it very, very quickly. In our own life, our children's life, there's nothing in the way now but excuses and old patterns holding us back. Those old fear patterns. If I give away mine, what will I have? We're going to find out if we give to each other, we're going to have more than we ever thought, ever, in this life. So, any other questions down here? So, what you're saying then, without this work that we're going to letting go of the work is that it just happening automatically. That's the best way. You're in an automatic mode of growth that's absolutely fantastic. The only thing that can distort that is your fear, and fear manifests on all levels. It'll impact your immune system, it'll affect your money. It'll, the fear, the fear issues of survival is what the same issue makes one man rich and another man poor. It makes one man really overwork and another man not work at all. The same issue really when you boil it all down. So, another question? Back here? Yeah, I'm really interested in what you're talking about with technology. I just read a book by Hutchinson called Mega Brain. And he, he talks about a lot of technology after this was written about six years ago. And it's everything from biofeedback to, um, to um, light patterns that match brainwave activity. And it seems like all the different technologies that he talked about centered on helping people develop certain brainwave patterns like alpha and mm -hmm. beta. I'm not really clear exactly. I'm sure it gets a lot more sophisticated than I can say, but I'm just curious what, when you're talking about technologies for children and all the technologies for adults, what kinds of technologies are you talking about? Um, in the future or now? Now. I mean, he proposes that we're on the threshold of the expansion in consciousness and that he's really interested in the, the technologies because he thinks they're going to facilitate that. Um, exactly. Um, it's going on in every level, from weapon systems to drug use. And I went to a conference of scientists very recently, and they've been discovering uh, certain parts of the magic mushroom they've been exploring. I was thinking, this is amazing. They're in the laboratory exploring consciousness, finding ways to use that to help people, to toys, to whatever. I'll, I'll get back. You know how weapons are transcending right now? weapon systems on the planet at Los Alamos and those other places. The whole focus now is stun weapons, not to kill people. To stun people. That's 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 higher consciousness in one sense. Uh, children are into more multidimensional stuff than we ever thought. Just look at their toys compared to the toys that we had. You know? When I came into the world TV was rather new, a new medium. To your children born today, it's like nothing. They've got computers they're going into. And those are opening up net neural networks across the entire planet that we didn't have access to. Across the entire planet. What a child can do today is a lot more than what Einstein could do in his time. So you see how things are evolving very quickly now. The knowledge base, just in medicine alone, is, is quadrupling like every four years. The knowledge base alone, in just that one art, uh, so each year, the, the arts and sciences the, and the education system that we have today is really a dinosaur system. It was, came in the inception of the Industrial Revolution to promote the Industrial Revolution, and it was well needed. 
It brought people in, though, from the light. I'll be talking about a lot of that in the workshop tomorrow, how that has affected each and every one of you, and then how we successfully, generation after generation, have been born with low chakra activity, low chakra activity, how, how uh, chronic fatigue syndrome is the modern disease of light beings being starved for light. And we've developed systems and ways that we can show you in the workshop to get your energy back up. Because we're all low on energy right now. All human beings in this modern world that live indoors, work indoors, eat indoors, and do everything indoors. We're energy beings. And so in the blinking of an eye, we come indoors and it severely affected the species. If you can see the time-lapse movie like I saw on the other side, you can see that the Industrial Revolution, this great coming in of doors, is, is, like, a, is like a day, it's like in one day we changed the whole way of being in cosmic time and we're having the reactions generation after generation now. And when we start addressing this, mental problems are disappearing. I'm amazed uh, when, we, uh, when we use these systems on humans how many different levels are affected when the energy is up because my whole theory behind all the technology that I develop is that the universe is self-organizing and self-correcting and you're a universe. You are self-organizing and self-correcting. All healing is self-healing, all healing. No matter if you go to a healer or the hospital or whatever, you're getting energy attention, energy attention. All healing is self-healing. Why most people don't heal is that they don't have enough energy to trigger it. That's why with these lasers we can we can focus on a wound and it speeds up the system without any harmful side effects whatsoever, without any drugs whatsoever. The system heals itself with the optimal energy in the system. The human body and the human brain is state-of-the-art equipment. It's like every one of you was given a Maserati. But, you know, most of us, the battery's dead and we're out of gas. We're pushing the thing. We're pushing the thing. So, luckily, luckily, all this can be easily turned around when you address the energy body. So, if you address the cellular and molecular, it's going to be real slow. Real slow now. Again? You, you talked earlier about um, the growing uh, sacredness and understanding of, of each other in human life and so on. But what we all experience these days, I think, as we see, is a growing disregard for human life. I mean, people are blowing other people away for just giving them a dirty look. And, and the kids themselves are doing it too. So what's, what do you feel that's all about? Well, as I saw it, why our children are shooting at us is they're trying to get our attention. <laughs> they haven't got our attention. Our education system is failing. And getting back to that, our education system is a dinosaur system predominantly set up to, to make you, turn you into a, pursu a consumer and producer. Yeah. Classes are graduating from college every year. There are no jobs for them. Colleges, schools should be now reoriented into human skills and how to be great humans. You see? Why? And that's one reason why they're shooting at us. Another reason is that add all that up together. When, when, when a human, whether it comes from a middle class, higher class, or, or ghetto family, when a human senses for whatever reason there's no hope, this human becomes dangerous and critical. They are volatile. A hopeless human being is, is a dangerous creature. Dangerous creature indeed. So we need to address the hopelessness out there. There's a lot, there's a whole part of our, our segment uh, of our population around the world that's not really clued into what's going on with the rest of the population. They're, they're just, we're, we're just letting them languish away, this great potential of human spirit languish away. Um, secondly, as I saw it on the other side, you add up all the wars mankind has ever had, and it's a thimble compared to the rest of the system. You spend one night in the jungle naked and you'll know what I'm talking about. I was shown this on the other side, because I asked that. I said, why are humans so evil? Why are we just so screwed up? And I saw that we're not at all compared, depending on what you compare it to. Ants have had more wars over <laughs> millions of years than humans ever will have, ever will have. That's just one part of the system. Think about those nature films where a mother has to guard its young all night, and get, you know, all night and all day just searching for food, food, food. I would rather take my chances in New York City ghetto, honestly, than one night in the jungle naked because everything's food there. Sure, we still reflect the animal system. We still prey on each other. There's still prey-predator relationships going on. The human system is infinitely more graceful just on that level, the violence level. Now, to compare human violence, to call it evil or bad, is, 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 is we're part of the Gaia system. We're part of a system. To call humans evil is to say the same thing that a lion that chases down a gazelle is evil. 
It was the same system, except we're going to transcend that. A lion will hunt a gazelle for a long time to come. Humans will not hunt each other that much longer and pray once we address the greatness of the human character and we reconfigure our education systems. And the rehabilitation of the human race is enormous already, enormous. And we're already infinitely more graceful system. I would rather be in this system than even the atomic system. You see? So I, I made that give you a little perspective on what I saw. Mm -hmm. Can I help with that a little bit, that question? Mm -hmm. Mel, what can we do to transcend our fear more quickly? Well, we're going to be talking about that a lot in the workshop tomorrow. Basically, we need a higher consciousness is going to take higher energy. A lot of spiritual people haven't seen that. I saw it on the other side very clearly. Luckily, that's going to be really easy to do. It's not, it's not work at all. The work is over for mankind, really. The hard work is over. Now, the school of pain is going behind us. The school of joy opens up. The future is about the school of joy. The sign for you is that if it feels like work, reconfigure it. Or do something that doesn't feel like work to you. Find something you can have some passion about in this world. Also, understanding that everything that you do, whether you're uh, the, the bag boy at the grocery store, or the genius on the computer, or the wino in the gutter, all has an important place in the whole system. Again, we're going to start forgetting it's not what you do, it's that you are. That's the most important thing. It's what you are, it's that you're here. That's the most important thing. And so, uh, uh, to transmute fear, there's, there's many ways. So the first thing I always tell people is to breathe. <laughs> breathing is one of the best ways. Deep breathing. We'll, we'll be going into some of these exercises tomorrow and showing people how, how breathing alone can help you transcend fear and also purge the system of negativity in a very interesting way. Um, and we're going to have Patty Mann there tomorrow. She's going to show us some of her very special uh, uh, techniques that she's developed. Uh, it's going to be interesting. So um, there are many ways. Uh, the good news is there's an infinite number of ways to do it nowadays. And um, I, I've, I've said this before, but since 1985, I've been blessed to be able to go around the planet and pretty much look into whatever I want to look into, which has mostly been about healing, from the Philippines to, to you name it, to technology. And one thing I've noticed around the world is that I've seen people healed by holy men, holy water, holy women, holy places, holy trees, and holy moly. I've seen holy moly work, you know, putting your hand to the TV screen for that preacher. Got you here. Grab a mirror. That's what I do. I go, I'm going to get some of this. You know, if it's there. If it's real, I'm going to get some of it. And you'd be surprised how much comes through. It's very interesting. That, that, that minister at that moment might be just in the right energy configuration for you to get it. So my, my estimation is, I think everything works. I haven't seen anything that doesn't work. The trick is, find what works for you. If, if, if the modality, uh, uh, philosophy, religion you're into really isn't giving you happiness in your life or giving you the desired results that you want, not what anybody else wants, but what you want, try something else. Change the channel. You will find what works for you in all systems. If you'll loosen up, grow, and try something else if it isn't working. Be free enough to try. And that includes relationships all the way down on up. This is the entire system. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've noticed you speak of the future in the present tense. Mm -hmm. You say the future is. Yeah. The, uh, that's fifth dimensional awareness coming in. Um, in fourth dimensional awareness, you have a sense of a past, a present, and some sense of a future. And we understand uh, in fourth dimension that our present affects whatever we do in the future, say tomorrow, the next day, or even 100 years from now. And in fifth dimensional awareness, <clears throat> the now expands and encompasses the past, the present, and the future simultaneously. This is why we're, we're getting into past life regression, future life, future life progression, big time now, more than ever before on the planet. Uh, this is bringing the past, present, and future into the now. Our now expands. The present moment expands. That's what humans are capable of. Um, and as we do that, some people are going to think they're going nuts because they're going to they're be aware of, of, of voices. This could be past life stuff playing back. That they're going to see maybe visions, which could be your, yourself interfacing with yourself, actually and a multi-dimensional interface. And this is why I think many ghosts are. They're actually seeing an aspect of yourself in the past and the conditions in your body, the atmosphere, everything's just right to trigger the veil to be pulled open and you get to see these things. And fifth dimensional awareness, one of the big things that we realize is, and I saw this clearly on the other side, was that now we believe that <clears throat> the present is changeable. And if the present's changeable, then obviously the future must be changeable. But in fifth dimensional awareness, the past is changeable. 
It's all changeable, and it's all, as I saw the movie on the other side, it's all been changing. All the, the past is changing, the present's always changing, and the future's always changing. It's a very dynamic, simultaneous system. Uh, Seth called it, I think, uh, uh, one aspect that I experienced was simultaneous reincarnation. I experienced that on my re-entry in, into life. Uh, I remained conscious through that, through that, uh, that episode. What I saw <clears throat> on the other side is that when most people go to the light, their energy faints, their energy faints. And so they go through the rest of the process rather unconsciously as an energy form. And that you're really targeting each other, not so much by names really, because there have been many people many times. What you're targeting is the nearest close matrix of frequencies that you resonate to. And that's why if your parents in this life die and you're reincarnating in a future life and then say they're, they, they have the possibility of being your parents, if they're not mating at the time you're re-entering, you're going to go to the next closest match to your frequency. That's why it keeps expanding. Uh, it's not that we target each other by names and that sort of thing. And in fact, many times when you think you've found an old, an old soulmate, you've found the frequency of that soulmate in another human being. And we all have twins, and we have twin soulmates, and all that sort of thing that's going on. So uh, uh, reincarnation uh, really becomes a science in the future, like archaeology. So that you dig through consciousness and you explore many, many things. It's going on big time in the future. They're, they're doing tons of regressions on you now. So some of the stuff you might be picking up is your own self accessing your neural network and your consciousness in very interesting ways. And you go, well, what was that from? And you may misinterpret it quite often. As, as, as you do past life regression even further back into the past, and into the non-technological age, say the dark ages or whatever, yourself in that time may be aware something's going on and freak out. They may think they've seen God. They may think they've seen the devil. <laughs> they may think they're hearing voices and seeing things. It's a part of this multi-dimensional interface that's going on, this phase shifting. So that it's, it's a very dynamic system. And it's all changeable. And one of the great good news is that we can change the past. None of you have to live with any of the past that you don't want to anymore. And there's many techniques for rewriting your past. I suggest you do it. Rewrite your past to the configuration that you resonate with perfectly. Those situations didn't work out. Write them as working out rewrite them. This will affect, as, as, as you change that, you change the past. You also change the present when you let go of that. How many people have experienced this in aggression? You know, that let go, that getting it together finally, that working out on a deeper level of issues. It's amazing. It's really quite healing. Okay, another question? Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the question was, um, again, what happens to animals and people who suddenly are taken out violently? violently? Yeah. Um, much more serious with humans than with the animal system or trees. They're in a different incarnation cycle than we are. Uh, very, very, uh, very tight incarnational cycle. And there's a grace that happens in that level of consciousness that they don't know they're dying, as I saw it. They don't experience death. They do not know they're dying. They also do not know they've been born. They're in the total now, which is a beautiful place to be. You know, but humans are, are much more expanded. Now, to a human being, to, as I saw it on the battlefield, someone who's hit by a bomb and their, and their body vaporizes, uh, they're still there. I know that when I died, I was outside my body wondering, well, I'm still here, I can think. All of that seemed to be still with me, but I, I, wasn't, I was outside my body. To people in war, this happens en masse. And it can be quite confusing, quite confusing indeed, and can really slant an incarnational pattern. Because the very frequency at the moment of death really slants your incarnational trajectory back in. Uh, people that were burned at the stake, and I've worked with many of these people, I, 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 I really like working with people that have been persecuted in the past because I really have a way of helping them clear on, on all levels. You know, uh, say you were burned at the stake in the past, and let me tell you, I got to see this in history, that burning at the stake was a very, very messy affair in the old days, if you could really see what happened. The, the beating, the torture beforehand, uh, then if the wood was wet, it could take half a day to actually kill somebody. The wind, I mean, I saw it. It was, And if you die during that, your entire, your entire cellular atomic structure is vibrating at a certain pitch. When, when you die, the cellular memory is carried on through the auric structure. It's a subatomic measurable structure that, trans, that actually survives what we call physical death. The old body dies, the cellular memory in that system dies and goes back to the elements. But the energy of that is carried on right into the next body. And so you can come in with very, very skewed trajectory and chakra damage and all that sort of thing. Um, spina bifida, things like that, I see as part of this problem. 
of incarnating at a very weird trajectory, child abuse, things like that. So um, one thing that's going to become more and more important is birthing and deathing centers. To be born in, born in optimal configuration for enhancement and to die optimally and, and have it be a fantastic non-fearful experience. And the trend now, uh, as I did with myself, is to try to remain conscious through the experience. You can. Death is an interactive experience. When they hit the light, they faint. The energy is so great. It's almost like an eagle grabbing a rabbit. You know, it faints and goes out at that point. It's grace, actually. And so, if you can remain conscious through the light experience, you will be conscious as I, as I was of the entire incarnational mechanics and, and system, which is absolutely fantastic system, and beautiful system. Um, so, uh, I hope that answered your question a little bit. Back here. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have a question. I had a mm, heightened experience for a period of time where I was about the death of my father, both before and after he died, premonitions, <coughs> visitations, and I have a question about something that didn't make sense, didn't quite make sense to me, and I wondered if you had any questions about it. Mm -hmm. um, the day after his death, I had a dream where he let me know he was tired and he went to lay down for a while. The following night, or within a few nights, I had a dream where he was crying and going through a struggle, wanting to re-enter his body, and I was there telling him that he couldn't because it was tired and broken and he could not return, and he was in conflict. Now, do you have anything you can relate to this in terms of coming back with into the same body or another and being in that in-between place? You can. Um um, don't limit him that way. I came back into my body and I was very surprised. I came back into my dead body again. It's very, very possible for that to happen and maybe we can assist people in doing that. I saw the metaphor for the whole Jesus Lazarus thing on the other side. And as I saw it, uh, Lazarus was one of the better students who really got the message. And really, um, uh, Lazarus is the one that did all the work uh, of coming back into the body. Jesus was an anchor point and people can be that. This is what my hospice caretaker sort of did for me by staying with the body the whole time, in a way, unconscious way. Um, uh, the kahunas understand this. There are certain uh, rituals and techniques for calling a person back in to a same body again. But the trick is that it's not the shamans that does it, it's you. They're only a, a focus point for you to get back to that point and assist you in re-entry. You do the work. Lazarus is the one who came back to life. Jesus did not bring him back to life. Can I just add one thing mm -hmm. to that? There was definitely something going on there where I was present with my father mm -hmm. much of the time, mm -hmm. up until I took him to the hospital, mm -hmm. left, and it was during that time mm -hmm. that I was gone that he chose to leave. Sure. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I guess I'm trying to come to terms with that. I've had some people say <coughs> that it's easier to leave mm -hmm. if there's not that connection there. I know that I yeah. actually physically and spiritually did some things mm -hmm. that kept him around. Exactly. I feel that. I believe yeah. that. Um, and I, I do a fair amount of hospice work myself, and uh, I know that uh, if, if the family is in a certain configuration, not wanting to let go, they tend to hang on longer than they should, really. Um, uh, I always tell people, though, you, you, can, you can get healed on this side or the other side. I get You can always get, don't limit it. Don't ever limit it. Uh, but truly, it's quite normal from my experience and what I've seen in the work that I do that the minute you left, you, you checked out, you released him actually. And I can tell you, there's a definite chakra impact when a parent dies, because you come out of their system, especially when a mother dies. And I'll be going into that in detail. And many people that I work with, I always ask them that a relative die, um, is your mother still alive? And we can go back, and there's, there's things that happen that you don't even associate with your mother or father's death that happen to you physically afterwards symptoms, illnesses, even people that manifest the same illness after a parent goes. And I'll be talking about that in, in detail, because uh, it's very important in my work that I do and that people should be aware of, but it takes a lot longer to explain it than I can tonight. But you can definitely have a tremendous shock or impact as a parent, especially if they die slowly and you're their uh, principal caretaker. And this is something hospice people should look to, because it's only, it's an energy thing. It's not about anybody trying to give you anything or whatever. It's an energy thing that we'll be talking about in great detail, how that works. But uh, quite common, quite common. Uh, if any of you have lost parents, you should really go get uh, your energy tuned up again, get some chakra balancing, get, get active, uh, to hold off any of the residual of the impact. Also, surgery is tremendous impact on the chakra system usually. And uh, uh, there are people that I work with that we treat them before they go into chemo and afterwards to get that chakra optimally balanced. So.
those sort of things. Okay. Um, hey, back here. Hi. I have uh, quite an active dream home. Mm -hmm. I mean, vivid dreams every single night. <clears throat> yeah, she asked, uh, "What are the roles of dreams in, in the human life?" Uh, it's it's one of the things that's very special about human beings: the dream state. Uh, we're multidimensional beings, and uh, dreams are our way of becoming multidimensional. Uh, it's fantastic what, and you probably know yourself, what people have done, can do in dream states. Actually, amazing. From cures to diseases, like Edgar Casey, we call the dream state, to astral travel, multidimensional interface, visiting other star systems. Uh, it's very, very special about us. It's one of the things that, in the rest of the galaxy, humans are really known for, is this dreaming. Uh, and our dreams are very, they're energy, they're real energy, so that you can create and decreate in a dream too. And lucid dreaming is going to become more and more popular now. Uh, in fact, uh, once you realize that this is a lucid dream, <laughs> it's all a lucid dream, and it's all changeable. Uh, what's great about lucid dream is that no matter what the dream is, once you get lucid, you realize that you can change any part of it, it will. This is how plastic the universe is. And when uh, uh, creature own reality is going into mass consciousness now very rapidly, very rapidly indeed, and when people catch on how easy true magic is and manifestation, it's awesome. It doesn't take work. It doesn't take uh, that much energy, in fact, to manifest. And in fact, uh, uh, in our own ways, we're learning to manifest more and more now. How many people are finding it easier to manifest things? It's just sort of happening. Uh, sometimes it happens when I was only thinking about it. I wasn't even sure I wanted it. So, you know, in the 5D reality, you should really kind of figure it out first. With, you know, before it manifests, you have to deal with it. <laughs> so, okay, right here. You spoke of the hopelessness of the educational system for the young people. Mm -hmm. What do you see changing, and how can we be a part of that change? For By that the, the, the first thing you can do is be um, very supportive tax-wise through education system. But more than that, don't just put in your money. Put in your bias mm -hmm. to the system. Uh, the school boards are out of touch. Yeah. They're dinosaurs. The head doesn't know what the tail's doing. The, the basic education system is really configured wrong to uh, really produce optimal human beings. Beings that, are, uh, that really have human, human skills and there's a lot, there's a depth, there's a depth to humans that's not even being addressed in our education system. Secondly, really uh, support your education system, but more than that, make sure they spend the money in the right way. Now, what I saw on the other side was that education and penal systems are going to change and that they're going to go into private hands. And it's going to be cheaper than paying taxes. Mm -hmm. And the government's going to go for it, and you're going to go for it. And this ungluing, when it goes into private hands, which is the trend now, uh, is going to be from now on, is that there, uh, the, the, the systems that are already up and running, like Montessori and Steiner schools and all that, finally get a chance to blossom in a, a situation in which anyone can go to, that you can pick the schools you want to go to in the very near future. And it's also going to be much cheaper to operate and much more efficient than the system now. Mm -hmm. so, so, so Gaia is always laying in systems well in advance. We already have prototype education systems. Mm -hmm. You see already here that can develop more, but we already have them here. They're already here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. you said you saw in the future in California we're going to be having this. What are all these theories about California dropping off into the well, uh, I may be the only one predicting it's not going to. Okay. <laughs> I, I really don't see it happening from what I saw on the other side. And I really don't see uh, what um, uh, these, uh, you know, Map America and stuff, many of you've seen yeah, where it's, it. yeah, yeah, it's all going to be flooded and, and Denver's going to be like the beach, you know. <laughs> what, what's happening there, and I go, I go, I go into this in great detail in a chapter in my book uh, on Doom and Bloomers. Um, we, are, we are a tiny piece receptor unit. And all of history in the galaxy is very huge. So we're like this little funnel that it all tries to come through. And many people that are oriented, and you know, there are some psychics that are very good about picking up death, very good about picking up accidents and police cases and stuff, because they're tuned for that. I don't do that at all. I'm not tuned for it. I tried it a couple of times. I'm just not really tuned for criminal cases and that sort of thing, so I don't even bother with it. But there, there are many that do, that are tuned into when earthquakes are going to happen and whatever. They're just tuned for that sort of thing because of their incarnational patterns and issues. Um, quite often, what, what some of these doom and gloomers are saying is going to happen now is they're the funnel, and if you could see cosmic time, we're talking over a long, 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 long period of time, these events may happen. But in the now, I wouldn't worry about it. You see, it's, it's this huge, and they're, 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 in other words, they don't realize that this is, in, we're speaking in cosmic time here, we're not speaking like tomorrow or something like that. 
So I, I uh, also the Earth is much more stable now than it's ever been. If you just check the geology, the geology, the history of geology of the planet, we come from a very violent geology, and we're very stable, more stable than we've ever been, which is a part of Gaia developing us right at this time in a very stable time in history for sustained consciousness. We're going to need this sustained consciousness. So the Earth is stabilizing. Uh, fossil fuels, okay, fossil fuels were basically a Gaia invention to stabilize the planet from another ice age, because an ice, we're way overdue for an ice age right now, and we've been doing Gaia's work by driving our cars every day, holding off the ice age. Believe it or not, <laughs> Gaia produces more pollution than we ever will. And in the near future, we terraform, and we cha we've changed the atmosphere many times, Gaia has changed the atmosphere many times in, in millions and millions of years. And humans, as a part of Gaia, are going to, this is the Gaia part saying, well, you know, we're going, to do a little, we're going to do a little different now, a little more focused. So humans will reconfigure the atmosphere again. We have the technology. It's, bur it's beginning to burgeon right now, the technology to have optimal atmosphere in, on the planet system. So uh, basically, I have to go now. I want to get rested up, and I'm getting the sign. So thanks for coming, and we'll do it again sometime. Hello, this is Melon Thomas, and I hope that my insights from the other side will in some good way inspire you to love your life and this miracle planet that we share with all of Gaia's children. We are all, in so many ways, blessed beyond measure. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for supporting our planet work. This is CD number three in the series, Insights from the Other Side. On this CD is the second interview with Barbara Rose, entitled, Preparing for the World Not to End. Topics include, How Mankind Becomes Free of Survival Existence. Reincarnation, We Are All About to Be Born Again. And, Believe It or Not, we are wise and graceful beings. Okay, let's get started. And good evening. We're back, and the show begins. And we will begin at the beginning of this amazing experience that uh, Mellon had. In fact, I think some of you probably heard uh, quite a, an extended version of his near-death experience. And we're going to shorten it a little bit so that we can tell you uh, so that we can have you join us with some phone calls and also talk about some things that weren't discussed on the last program, specifically end of karma and fifth dimensional reality. Welcome, Mellon. Thank you. It's good to be here again. So what was it like coming back? <laughs> what sort of a person were you when you, when you emerged um, back into your body with this information? Well, um, before I died, I was... Uh, uh, real uh, real pessimist. I really believed that the human race was going to destroy the planet and overpopulate it and destroy everything on its way. And I really believe uh, that because I started perceiving you know, humanity as a rampant, out-of-control cancer, that that's why I developed my cancer. And my, uh, I got a real good case of it, a terminal case. Uh, the difference is that when I came back, that everything I went over thinking was a problem was actually part of a solution. I had not been seeing it in a big enough picture. And I was given the big picture of what uh, all of this is about on the planet, including nuclear missiles, toxic waste, population, uh, karma, reincarnation, all of these things where I was educated. And I got a tour on the other side of the uh, Kazakh records. This is where all knowledge is. Uh, not only is it, the Kazakh records is full of the good, the bad, the great, the awesome, the ugly. It's, it's everything that is, that ever was, is, is in the Kazakh records. And those are Kazakh records, by the way, also stored in every cell of your body, in every atom in the universe. We're never far from. It's like the, a hologram. That's right. We're never far. We're in the Akashic records. <laughs> so who or what was giving you this tour and giving you this experience? How do you um, describe that? When I was in front of the light, um, not being a very religious person at the time, um, the first thing the light changed into, because I came from a... a uh, a Western Christian oriented background I saw Jesus and I mean I really saw the vibration of Jesus is for real it's a true vibration 
And then it changed into like Buddha and Krishna. I'm talking about the real vibrations. I, I really know these things are for real. And it started changing into many, many other kinds of uh, gods and, and, and uh, 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 people that had been on the planet to enlighten us. And I asked the light, I said, well, who is the real God? What's the real God? And the light said something to me that, that absolutely electrified every, everything that I had ever known. And the light said, I am. But what that meant was that each and every one of us is God, period. We are all made of God's stuff. And the I am meant that you are, I am, we all are God. And then I was given the big picture of what Godhead may be, and we have a very limited concept of it right now in our system. You know, there are many people still thinking that God is some sort of male figure with a beard up there <laughs> waiting at the pearly oh, gates. Oh, they can't. They don't <laughs> think that. <laughs> if, you, if you still do. Uh, I was enlightened about that. Did you, think, it, did you think God was a, was a gray-haired man with a beard? I didn't know. It was never a big question to me <laughs> until I died, and you know, I kind of got serious about it but, uh, right before I died. But, but what was really speaking to me was what I call the great self. Uh, the entire universe, the entire Godhead experience of which we're a part of is one large, one great self that's ever expanding, that never had a beginning and doesn't have any ending. Um, the old question of where did, where did it all come from is mute in the larger universe because it never had a beginning and it never has an ending. And that's a concept we're just barely even being able to even conceive at this level of consciousness. And that, that's, that's a hard... That's, it really is. It's impossible. To think of something that never had a beginning. It's, it's, uh, but soon we'll, we'll be conscious enough to grasp that concept. Mm, you think so? Oh, yeah, very soon. Very, very soon, this entire spiritual trip humanity's been on will be completed because spirituality in the Godhead universe is just one small band, like a, like a rainbow. It's the violet band. And there are many other bands of consciousness experience in the universe besides spirituality and besides materialism. In fact, I learned that there's more to this Godhead universe than life and death. There's more than forever. There's more than time and space. Much, much more. We're just barely even beginning to get into a level of consciousness where we can even begin to even even toy with those ideas. When you say that, that this process is unfolding rapidly and soon we're going to be in another, another um, mm -hmm. relationship to it, what do you mean by soon? Uh, in cosmic time, in the blinking of an eye now. It's, it's so close, it's a breath away. Everything that mankind, all the highest aspects, uh, some in the, in, in the Christian religion would call it the millennium, others would call it the age of Aquarius. It's been many, many names for it. The, the name now being bandied around, and I, I tend to use too, is we're coming into fifth dimensional awareness now. And it's hitting everybody, from housewives to metaphysicians. It's really coming on quite fast now. What do you mean you can invent on command? I have uh, access to the Kazakh records, and uh, scientists and people can ask me questions, and uh, I have a track record uh, that shows that I, I bring in very, very valid information. Not, uh, not so much philosophical, because that's, that's, I want it to be of some practical use to the world. Fifth dimensional reality. We have, we have three dimensions, fourth dimension, would you call that time? Mm -hmm. what, uh, we have already evolved through all the other dimensions, mm -hmm. uh, from the Big Bang to this moment. First, first dimensional reality is about subatomic structure, the, uh, the Big Bang experience. Uh, second dimensional reality is where the, uh, where the uh, atomic structure started forming in the individual atoms that form the physical universe to hold consciousness. Third dimensional reality is reality where we first come into sort of a consciousness, this 3D world that we know and live in, where you have tables and chairs and 3D reality around you. Does it involve the coming, coming out of matter into life? Yes. Mm -hmm. Three dimensional? And the evolutionary spiral begins. Mm -hmm. And in fourth dimensional reality, which we're well into now and coming to the end of, is when is the development of the mental realms and uh, plants have a little bit of this uh, animals have a little bit of it but the human beings are really the masters of fourth dimensional reality which means uh, a concept of time and space concept of history in fourth dimensional reality a mental reality you're able to develop technology and that technology will allow you to look at a star and to figure out what that star is made of and then to figure out that you're made of that star Mm -hmm. Fifth dimensional reality, which we're coming into very rapidly now, is when we go beyond the mental. The mental has served us, and it will serve us in the future, but the mental is only a small part of the being that we really are, only one band in the rainbow that we are. 
fifth dimensional reality is the gateway to all other dimensions. When you finally reach a fifth dimensional awareness, you are in a, in a, in a an awareness that can conceive of the past, the present, and the future in the now. And this is happening as we talk all around the world. It is also getting into a dimension of manifestations, and manifestations are starting to happen all over the planet. More and more people are doing manifestations. What do you mean by manifestations? Manifestations would be something like what Sai Baba does, you know, where they can make material appear out of thin air, when they're basically using the uh, atomic structure of the universe to do that. There's plenty of energy in the universe to manifest anything that we want. Uh, the universe is super abundant, super abundant. People like Sai Baba and others that are doing that and doing the manifestations today, making things appear out of thin air, are the hundredth monkey. Because if one human can do it, all humans can do it. And that's what they're really about for the rest of us to understand, not to worship them, but to realize what's coming. How does that process of manifestation work? How does someone like Sai Baba mm. or whoever... I've worked with some manifestors, but I can tell you that uh, it's a non-mental process. These are not intellectuals that are doing the manifestations on the, on the planet today. I, I know of no PhDs doing manifestations. No, not, not that I'm putting them down. But if you get too mental, you cut off the magic of life, and there's a lot of magic in the universe. How I see it when I work with manifestors is that all manifestors manifest with their eyes open. And I, and when I, I can see energy since I came back from the other side. I can see all sorts of realms of energy. And as I watch them and photograph them and film them, I, I can see that they, they have a fifth-dimensional visualization process going on in which you and I may be able to pick some, picture something in our head, but the minute you're able to picture it outside of your head, it will manifest. Can you, can you uh, explain that uh, in a little well, more detail? If you, if you can imagine uh, um, imagining a rose in your head and going over the details, uh, getting a picture on your mental screen, mm -hmm. that's the way most people visualize today. Uh, and that is a manifestation of certain thought form energy. To manifest physical uh, phenomenon, I really see that, <clears throat> say they want to manifest a rose in your hand, they have such an intense visualization process that they see in 3 and 4D reality, and the energy absolutely fills into that mold. It's an intense visualization outside of your head. So where does the matter come from that is... The matter comes from the local area, the atoms right around your hand, wherever it manifests. I've watched this and filmed it happening. And when it's happening, uh, it looks like, uh, if you've ever seen a time-lapse photography of something jumping around real quick mm -hmm. uh, as it goes through the time-lapse, right. this is what it looks like. It looks alive. And then suddenly, it, uh, matter forms, and then suddenly it forms into something. And it's an amazing process to watch. And I've made films of this, of people that are doing it. Hmm. Now, what you're suggesting is this is something that all of us can mm -hmm. do. Right. How do we get from where we are to doing this, if indeed it's something we want to do, which it sounds mm -hmm. like it is. It is, and it's a non-mental process. First, we have to learn to really engage the non-mental part of our being, which is the which is 99% of our being. What, what is the non-mental part of our the, being? The are you talking about the body? The, the physical, uh, the sensual, the atomic, uh, the vibrational. There's, uh, it goes on and on. There's, uh, there's so much outside of the mental realm. The mental realm can serve us well, but it also gets in the way quite often. What happens in the body, the bodies of people that have disability, in, in your understanding? Mm -hmm. uh, from what I've seen, people like Tomas in Brazil, who is a fantastic manifester, he was someone, and this seems to be a, a thing that runs through most manifestors that we've studied, is that at some point in their childhood they had a severe electrical event, like getting shocked, or Tomas, in his case, was struck by lightning. And this that seems qualifies to be, as that a seems severe to be, electrical uh, yeah, event. <laughs> yeah. It, this seems to do something to the pituitary gland and the pineal. Uh, and the scientists have been looking into this because there is a common thread throughout all manifestors. Uh, people that can uh, produce uh, uh, psychic phenomena, uh, PK, you know, psychokinesis, move things with so their mind. So it's related to these two glands, it seems? They think so. I mean, we're just beginning to get into the science of it, but I, I, I don't know if science will ever figure it out completely because most of the universe cannot be figured out, period. So, so going out on, a, on a stormy night and inviting a lightning mm -hmm. strike 
does not necessarily mean you're going to... Win. Yeah. Now, Tomas loves to go out in thunderstorms and get charged up and scream, energy, energy, and wants you to go with him. But I thought, I don't know, you know. So, But I did think about inventing beanies with lightning rods on them for those that would like to <laughs> chance it <laughs> or stick your finger in a wall socket. Who knows? So, so how many times has Tomas been struck by lightning? Uh, once that I know of uh, as a child. So and, then he just uh, goes out and, and enjoys the storms without being struck. Yeah, he has no fear. See, and this is another thing about the humanity's next level of, of evolution and consciousness is a realm in which is so different from our world today. We won't be in different bodies, but we will be in a different world. If you could understand the psychic world of, say, Rome when Julius Caesar was alive, it's a different psychic realm than we live in today, a different yes. head, in other words, yes. different thinking, different processing. The world of the future, which is very, very close, it's as close for many of us as our next incarnation, it's that close. This world in which uh, we will be able to manifest and, and do all of these sort of things is a world in which there is no fear. You see, we have to, the biggest thing, and we'll be talking about the end of karma too, the biggest thing humanity is processing right now is fear. And we have had fear since we were one-celled amoebas all the way to the present moment. We have known nothing but survival mode behavior and existence. So what's, what's the genesis of fear if we've had it that long? <clears throat> uh, the genesis is basically survival. And in the human uh, higher intelligence, we call it fear. Animals have this, but it's a survival uh, uh, a way of existence in which you, you're born, you eat, you reproduce, you die, and you start it over again. And the human being is the first part of the Gaia system that will transcend the survival mode of existence. And we are so very lucky to be human, because I can tell you what one night in the jungle would be like compared to one night in the human realm. Uh, the human realm is absolutely incredibly graceful realm, no matter what you think about what's going on out there from the media. So you, you really feel that contrary to the doom and gloom mm -hmm. r reports that we are filled with day, mm -hmm. day on a daily basis, mm -hmm. that we are heading out of this and that we're not going mm -hmm. to annihilate ourselves or destroy our planet or, mm -hmm. you know, X, Y, Z? Absolutely. I got, I got a, a, a review of world history and especially in detail for the next 400 years. The people of the future look back on us in this time as the giants of history. Can you believe that? It's absolutely amazing. that We don't even know what we're doing that is benefiting mankind. We are, we are that, those of us that lived in the Industrial Revolution are a small burst of energy that set mankind free, because we're not meant to be industrial animals. That was only, the Industrial Revolution altogether will be a small segment of human evolution. The, the future is non-industrial. We can talk about that later if you want to. But the future is non-industrial. I came back in 82 telling people that there will never, ever again in history be as many jobs as there once was before. There's no need for it anymore. We're moving into a different society and a different world. Now, as we move into fifth dimensional awareness, we become incredibly sensitive to everything around us. And this is what I'd like to talk about uh, on, on Saturday and in my talks that I give these days is to help people understand what's happening to them, that they're not going crazy at all, and to not let people tell them they're going crazy. We are rapidly moving into an awareness that includes the past, the present, and the future. It includes seeing angels. It includes seeing energy and dimensions. And uh, uh, incredibly uh, more psychic sensitivity in the human being now than ever before. And this sensitivity is also the very sensitivity that, that is driving some people crazy because they, if... In fifth dimensional awareness, if your job is not right for you, you will not be able to stand it. Your cells and your body will not be able to stand it. Uh, there's, a, there's a great correction that goes on as we move into the fifth dimensional awareness. And that's, that's for a very good reason, because once we move into the next realm, which is a manifestation realm, uh, create your own reality en masse, um, if we took fear with us, we would destroy the world very, very rapidly. Uh, we, we know the mind-body connection now and how our thoughts and stress can destroy our immune system slowly. If you're in a manifestation mode and you have this kind of stress and fear, you will destroy your immune system instantly. So there's a natural... So you'll destroy yourself exactly. instantly. You, and, and in this realm we live in now, whenever you have a negative thoughts or argue with somebody, you're getting more of it than they are. Sure. You see, and we're starting to begin to realize that. Fifth dimensional awareness is also about realizing that we're part of a larger living being called Gaia, that we're a part of a being that's much larger than ourselves. 
you, you mentioned the hundredth monkey theory, or as uh, Rupert Sheldrake sometimes <coughs> calls it, the, what does he say, the thousandth rat effect. <laughs> <laughs> that, <laughs> I love that. I like thousandth. How about the second banana? The second banana. <laughs> um, is it, do you have a sense of us heading towards a point in the near future when we just sort of wake up together all of a sudden in some morphic, well, uh, simultaneous awareness? In cosmic time, yes. In cosmic time, it will now happen in the blinking of an eye. But humans tend to want to wait for a certain day. Date, you know. So we're and not going to wake up tomorrow and suddenly we some will. This some have waken up ten years ago. Some are waking up this moment. Some are waking up ten years from now. In cosmic time, the next, the, the previous, the, the hundred years before us and the hundred years after us is absolutely a blinking of an eye. And in cosmic time, that's pretty much on the dime. Everybody's going to be pretty much waking up in the same time, you see. So how do you think the, um, the people in the future are going to perceive you? Are you going to be... Um, well, I've seen the future, and I know what I'm known for in the future. What are you known for, Thomas? <laughs> I'm known for my second book. <laughs> Your second book? <laughs> <laughs> Called The Unimaginable Meaning. <laughs> ah, good. So we have the end of karma to talk about, and mm -hmm. then we'll open up the phone lines. Okay. What do you mean by karma's the, ending? The end of karma is very, very exciting, and uh, uh, a way to get into it is to say that, uh, I don't know how many people have noticed this, but I've been talking about it ever since I came back, that all the prophecies on earth of every culture there is ends in our lifetime very soon now. Say that again. Every prophecy on earth ends in our lifetime. And that's because the ancients had no way to predict what's going to happen next. And that's, and, and that's again, because up till now, the future's been very, very easy to predict. It's is just that, been a repeat of the past. Is that perhaps, this is kind of interesting, is that perhaps why the, uh, <clears throat> the Muslims, the Islamic people, say that Muhammad is the last prophet? That's always confusing. Well, that's their me. version, and that's their reality. Is that, um, but is that, is, that, is that speaking perhaps to this time? Not really. Uh, we're going to have uh, uh, wise ones with us for a long time. We manifest these beings. The humanity manifests these beings, these Christ consciousnesses. They're just a part of our self that we manifest. Um, the end of karma, and the end of karma is very, very interesting. There's, uh, in the Industrial Revolution has broken up the old world issues time after time after time, and we're just about worn out with it. And the high divorce rate splits that breaks that breaks down. it up and the industrial revolution broke up the, the that old family unit that was a very narrow band of consciousness and the fundamentalists are freaking about this but really in Gaia's sense it's a freeing of the system for further growth what it allows us to do is extend families beyond the bloodline now you know we have we have uh, uh, foster families we have uh, you know uh, extended families now and we also are uh, bringing we're creating new types of families that are not necessarily related to bloodline. And yet are, are uh, just as strong in many ways. Oh, yeah, much stronger, in fact, and freer of the old things. The other thing is that en masse, people are, are disassociating from the past now. Not that the past is bad, it's just that it's time to change. And this is reflected by disassociating with our parents and things like that. There are many, many people... Uh, that love their parents, but they really need to get away from them. Mm -hmm. uh, th and you shouldn't feel bad about that. This is a part of the process. And you're saying that hasn't always been the case. Well, we've been stuck for survival reasons to our families. Even though we hated them or loved them, we, were, we could not survive without them. Does end of karma um, feel to you like what people are calling end of history? It is, a, it, it is the end of history as we know it. Um, we are... In fifth dimensional awareness and in the end of karma, people are going to start realizing that not only is the present changeable, the, the future is changeable, but more than that, the past is changeable. And we're not only going to change the future now, as we change the present, we are going to change the past. And that's because in, in fifth dimensional reality, everything's simultaneous. Yes, and because it's all... It's, see, the, these dimensions have always been here and more, it's just that we're waking up to them. It's, like, it's nothing new to the universe. It's new to us. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what's the process of changing the past? How does that work? How, how, will, the past, how will the past be changed? Uh, many people are doing it through past life, uh, regression work, future progression work. They're clearing out their past. And there's this urge in a, a lot of us to clear out our past. It's been holding us down. Mm -hmm. And literally, it's okay to go back into the past and rewrite your history. Any of your history you don't like, you don't have to carry anymore. You're not stuck with it. And I, I do quite a bit of this work in my own life and with others. Hmm. And anytime I go into a past life 
in which uh, there's something I don't like, I get the lesson first. Uh, it, is, it is perfectly all right and possible and tangible to go into the past and rewrite your history and create a new history. Now, we've been doing this all along anyway because all the history books throughout history have always been rewritten by who? The winners. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and mostly by men lately. Yes, you know? yes. uh, so, so who writes the history books? What is history really? In fact, reality itself is a very slippery thing. You know, ten people sure. can look at the same thing and get a different opinion of it, of and that's reality. Yes. Reality is nothing you can nail down, believe me. Yes. It's all changeable, it's all mutable, and the cat's out of the bag, and it's wonderful. So if we all simultaneously decided that our history was one thing rather than another mm -hmm. thing, mm -hmm. history would be changed, wouldn't it? Yes, and we've been doing this anyway throughout history. When we went uh, from different cultures and, and we took on the... Uh, different histories of those cultures. Our history up, right up to this point is very, very blend of everything. There's nothing pure about it. Uh, everybody's history is mixed up with everybody else's, and it just depends on what slant you want to put on the history in your history books. Uh, you know, what is history anyway? Is history some is a nail that you're going to stay pegged with on a cross the rest of your life? It's not that way. We've been taught it's that way, but it isn't. You can pull that nail and get free of it and rewrite your history. I've been doing this work extensively in my life since I came back, and I can, I can go back. I revisit past lives now to just to enjoy them, to spend can, can, time Can you give there. us an example? Uh, well, I've, uh, all of us have had some good lives, believe it or not. We've all had a couple of good lives here or there, m many lives, actually. Um, but there, there are certain lives, like I, I, I have a life that I like to revisit in Germany uh, around the 14th century. And I was a peasant, but I had a nice family and a couple of boys, and I had a cow and a, and a good <laughs> wife and a little hovel to live in. And uh, one of my favorite things was going hunting with the boys in the woods. It was a spend days, you know, and camping and, and come back with a catch. And uh, I remember in that, in that life, one of the highlights of that life was when I traded somebody for a cow. <laughs> you, tr you traded somebody I, for I, tra I actually got my own cow, and that was really, that's like having a Cadillac or something. It was what, what did you trade for the cow? Uh, well, it's kind of a long story, but it involves, um, whenever the landlords got in fights back then, they, they got the tenant farmers to fight for them. And I happened to, I happened to be on the land of a, of, a, of a lord that was always arguing with everybody. So, and if you didn't go fight, they put you off the land. So, and they didn't pay you to fight either. So this was a conscription deal. Uh, pretty much. <laughs> they didn't pay you to fight. So, so what, the, what the peasants would do is they'd go fight and risk their lives, but boy, when they got into town, they, they pillaged because we weren't being paid to risk mm -hmm. our lives. So you got good at looting. And I, I didn't catch on to this for a while. I would always get like in the wrong end of town and find it all looted. I discovered by accident, because I was very ignorant, that books were valuable, and the looters were overlooking the boot books. But I would find these books in some homes that had gold in them, and I thought it was just gold and valuable. And when I went to the next town, people, rich people wanted them. Hmm. So I remember trading a book for a cow. It must have been a really good book because the man gave me a whole cow for it. <laughs> and I thought that was the best deal I ever made. And on the way home, I bought some bread and some honey and, you know, had me some milk <laughs> and uh, had just the greatest time. Hmm. You see, simple things like that. What was your most dramatic uh, life memory? Uh, past life memory past, past was life when life. I ended my warrior path. Uh, many of us have been on the warrior path for many lifetimes. How to avoid it, I would think. I was one of them. Uh, I've spent many lifetimes as a monk or a priest, warrior priest, who was fighting for what I thought was right, you know, whatever, whatever that was at the time. And I remember my last life as a warrior, when I left the warrior path, I was a monk who would fight and uh, kill for the, for the side that I was on. Now, remember, in those days, at, uh, you would stop fighting around sunset, and you would literally go through the fields uh, giving the, the coup de grace, the, the killing off the wounded, because that was grace. You wouldn't let them suffer and let the dogs eat them and all that sort of thing. So it was at sunset, and I was moving through the field with some other monks just killing the wounded, and they would look in my eyes with such grace, saying thank you, as we would kill them quickly and move through the field. And we'd finished killing off the wounded, and I was wiping my sword, and uh, an angel appeared to me and said, uh, "This is you'll never do this again. It's over now. And I remember literally breaking my sword and walking off from the field, and I've never been a warrior since. Hi, you're on the air with Melon. Thank you. Um, earlier you touched briefly on um, some of us are getting more and more sensitive, mm -hmm. and um, some of us are being branded mentally ill. <laughs> 
and I'm as someone in that position, mm -hmm. I would just like some advice on how to handle that and to maybe make the shift from the mm -hmm. psychiatric diagnosis to um, coming to terms with the sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to get off the air and just listen to you. Okay. We, um, we can do that. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Bye. Um, I'm, <clears throat> I'm trying to get people to understand that this is happening to so many people now. And one person going through it will, will go through uh, the men, uh, end up uh, getting put in mental institutions, while another person, such as this woman from England who's re recently uh, written a book, you know, a very famous book that's been on all the talk shows now. She's a woman. Which one is that? Uh, she's a woman who uh, died in the 20s. As a grand, as a mother, and left six children to be orphaned. Oh yes, you know. Yes, I've seen. Now that. this is a, to me, a great example of how fifth dimensional awareness is hitting everybody. Now this is a woman who's a housewife in England, not very met metaphysically oriented, but she kept having these dreams of being someone else. And what happened to her children? Because she died in childbirth in the twenties, and her children were orphaned. How many did she have? Six. And so in this life. She has this rememory. It keeps coming back in stronger and stronger. So she gets some money together and goes to this town that she, she felt she ought to go to, finds the, the history of the family, but the children were all you know, like in their 70s and 80s by this time. They had never been brought back together. This woman, with this desire, found the children, brought them back together, My and gosh. they believe she's her mother. So in fifth dimensional reality, here's a woman who's in her 40s talking to her children who are in, her, in their 80s. <laughs> And they believe, you can see the videotapes, they believe this is her mother and her... And they are all legitimately of the same, of the same line. Yeah. And what's interesting is you get a picture of this mother in the 20s, and it looks like her today. Very, mm. very similar. Mm. But uh, to answer this woman's question, you can go both ways with it. Uh, I, if, if you're someone that's going into a spiritual crisis or a fifth dimensional crisis, be sure that the mental health people that you see understand something about spirituality or else they're going to classify you as some sort of mental illness, put you on drugs, and possibly commit you. This is a, this is a sad thing I, seeing out, I see out here. But there are spiritual crisis centers around. People are forming these, and it would be good to find out where these are and who are involved in these. When, and we should all be able to be compassionate with each other and realize if someone is, is, is really losing it because our reality is shifting dramatically right now, uh, we're seeing things, uh, we're hearing things, uh, the past is visiting us, the future is visiting us. Uh, all of this is going on. And we're operating, we have always operated on a multidimensional consciousness. It's now that we're becoming aware of it. We've always done this. We operate on many dimensions at the same time. We're multidimensional beings. Fifth dimensional awareness is the awareness of that. And so one thing I suggest to people, I teach in my workshops on how to get through this, is to breathe to really breathe and not get mental about it. Let it pass. Let it come through. Uh, some people write a book and get rich. Others end up in the middle hospital. It's just the way you handle it and who surrounds you as you're going through this crisis. That's an <clears throat> interesting point about who surrounds you. How do, mm -hmm. you, how do you identify who you should be with and who you shouldn't? Or well, if you're in, a, if you're in a, a state that's mm -hmm. that disturbing, how mm -hmm. do you make choices of, of how well, you... Well, pretty much, pretty much, uh, if you're married and have a family and stuff and you, this starts happening and your family's not into it, they're going to suggest you see a psychiatrist. Uh, it's time to seek out people that understand what you're going through and to reach out also for those who do understand, to reach out to those that don't understand what's going on. I talk a lot to uh, psychologists and counselors about this and, and how to help people with this. Um, a lot of people's third eyes are opening quite wide now, and that is the, uh, that is the multidimensional interface. Uh, when your third eye opens a little too much, you start seeing and hearing things. These are not imaginary, they're real, but if you go to a psychiatrist, they're going to tell you that you're, you're either s something, and they're going to probably put you on some sort of drug to bring you out of it, sedate that sort of consciousness. With chakra balancing, you can, you can actually adjust the third eye in the chakra system to handle fifth dimensional awareness. A whole lot of people are getting their third eyes opened right now too quickly, uh, and this this is just uh, part of the growth process. When you say too quickly, what's happening to them? Uh, it just hits them all of a sudden, and it's it's, it's an energetic thing that blows open the third eye, and suddenly you're you're a multidimensional being, and and you're trying to relate to several dimensions at the same time, and people think you're funny. Or, so it's like suddenly having LSD or something. Exactly, and in some cases. In other cases, you just may hear voices. In other cases, you just may see or feel things. The other thing about fifth dimensional awareness is that we're all becoming, we're all part of the same being, by the way. All human beings are the same being. And so if your foot's hurting, you know it. 
and in fifth dimensional awareness, if someone else is hurting in the world, you're going to feel it. And that's to sensitize us to take care of the rest of the world. We will know its pain intimately. Well, then in fifth dimensional reality, as we're experiencing it right now, it must be just pain. It must be sheer pain. Well, what we're processing is what I call universal pain. It's, it has been a long, hard road in evolution up till now. It really has been hard, a lot of work. Uh, we've been brutal to each other. We've been all of that. But we're coming out of it now. And uh, uh, it can be scary to some people uh, because it, 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 it's a shift. It's a definite shift in, in our normal reality. But it is something we can contain. We're, we're, we're built for it. We're built for it. We're, we're in, going into fifth dimensional awareness is like trying to walk again, you know, as a baby. We're going to uh-huh. stumble. We might bump our head. Uh, but uh, we shouldn't be locked up for it. Well, heck, that's it. That's all we can do for the calls, and and um, not too much. Oh, should we just should we one take more, one more, uh, one more, one more little one? Yeah. Hi, you're on the air, but you have to be quick. Okay, thank you very much, Barbara. <laughs> um, I have always had this question. I, I, I hope, I'll try to make this quick. You that's have to make hard it. for me. What's it like for a species, say a caterpillar or a, a butterfly, mm-hmm. that who designs these things? Who designs the bugs? Who designs the evolution of bugs through the millennia? The evolution of bugs, that's your question? Yeah. yeah. Now, now, that's very that's mental. A- that's a very mental way of looking at it. As I saw it, what Gaia is, is a great experiment in consciousness. Everything that's ever been on Gaia is an experiment in consciousness from the rocks, the, 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 the co- uh, how, how, the, how the planet coalesced into its solid form, and every plant and bug and everything on the way up to where we are is an experiment in consciousness. And Gaia is incredibly inventive. And to understand that, you have to go a little bit non-mental how that happens. But it, it is uh, all of it up to this point, and including this point, is an experiment in consciousness, grand experiments. Uh, even that of a butterfly is a grand experiment in consciousness. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you for calling. Bye. Hello, this is Melon Thomas, and I hope that my insights from the other side will in some good way inspire you to love your life and this miracle planet that we share with all of Gaia's children. We are all, in so many ways, blessed beyond measure. Thank you.